All right, uh, thank you very much for showing up. My name is Dino, as he said, and I have a really strange uh, last name. I often get a question about that. How do you say it? And I just say, think about Zlatan Ibrahimovic, then you can know my last name as well. So it's Opiach. All right, so let's talk about uh, uh, front-end frameworks. Who here uses a front-end uh, framework today? Uh, okay, so can I ask, do you use Vue? One guy, two guys, three guys. Great. How about React? Okay. Cool. Angular, 1.6. <laughs> One guy. Angular X. I don't know what version they're on right now. Okay. Cool. I just wanted to know, uh, know that. Uh, so yeah, I'm a software developer. I don't really like to call myself a software developer because I do much more than just developing software. Um, I think we need to to uh, to find a new word for that. Don't you agree? Uh, I have a background in the telecom industry, so uh, being a child of uh, or or a person that lives in Karlskrona, naturally, what you you do. Uh, as a developer there is that you have to pass through at least Ericsson and you have to pass through Telenor and some other uh, uh, companies that work in the telecom business. I have uh, this, this is a thing I do in all of my presentations. So I have a really problematic relationship with coffee. So people often ask me like, so have you stopped having that problematic relationship with coffee? And I say, no, but I, it's good that you have tabs on me. A uh, game pro programmer by night, I uh, used to love video games, now I'm old and I don't have time to play video games anymore, but I do like to, to make them, and uh, that process usually goes something like this. I make a, a small game, it completely bugs out, uh, I, have, uh, I have boxes that won't collide, uh, stuff ju just jump everywhere, and then naturally I decide to just throw it all away and do it again. Uh, so if anybody here is a game programmer, you can probably relate. <laughs> okay, so front-end frameworks and frameworks overall doesn't be a front -end, doesn't have to be a front-end framework. Uh, you might have tons of questions about this th thing, right? Um, how do I bundle it? Does it support TypeScript? Uh, how can how fast can we produce uh, content uh, or, or or meet requirements and so on and so forth? How can I test it? And one uh, one last important thing is probably is there a thriving community? Because I don't want to be working in a tool or a thing which isn't supported, right? Um, I think being in the front end is one of the harder fields, to be honest. Um, you have to take you have to take care of end users. You have to think about accessibility. You have to talk to different sorts of APIs. Uh, you have to work with npm, which is horrible, um, and yarn and all those uh, stupid tools. I say, um, yeah. So it's so it's pretty hard, right? Um, when we see these questions, our minds automatically go to uh, what I call the problem-solving mode, right? Um, and why do we do that? Is That's because we are humans. We are wired to think about solving uh, problems, okay? This is a thing we've been doing for 200,000 years. Back when we lived in the forest or in the savanna, we had to uh, basically think, uh, think like, will, will there come out a lion? If a lion comes, how do I protect myself? And nine out of 10 cases that never happens, but it's st still good to be prepared. And this thinking, it just pales, and uh, it, you still, as a modern human, you think like this, okay? Uh, okay, so being a human programmed by evolution, uh, one of your thoughts is, what if this framework just dies, okay? <laughs> and it's bound to happen, right? Uh, the last death we had was Angular 1.6. Uh, it's now on. Uh, on uh, it's getting some help from some company that gives you support, but you have to pay a lot. And uh, that's a fate that Vue 2 will soon be in, which is in uh, this December, I think. 
so me being a consultant, one of the things I think about is if a framework dies, how will I tell this to the customer? Um, but how will I handle the backlash? Uh, maybe one once upon a time I was the one who who suggested this, right? Uh, uh, I never do that, by the way. And uh, the customer will might come with some questions like, okay, so what do, what do we do do now? Uh, do we still use Angular One, or do we move to Vue or React? Or you know, it's really really a tough thing to answer. And just like uh, uh, what Marcus uh, talked about earlier, uh, it's really hard to predict the future, right? Um, but what I usually do is I try to focus on the things that's are, that are really important when it comes to, to frameworks, right? The framework or the tools and all of that, those things you, you use on a daily basis is, a, is just a detail, right? Um, what I often do or all the time, is th think in terms of business. Like the products uh, we build, what problem does it solve? Uh, can we build it in a way that responds to customer needs and all of that, right? So lean on those things and that will help you. So let's uh, uh, fast forward a bit and let's assume that you all are thinking about the business. Of course, you're here. Um, being aware of stuff is really good uh, and you have the uh, knowledge of the domain and so on and so forth and uh, now it's time to make technical decisions okay uh, there's tons of stuff you need to think about I've made a list here um, there are probably hundreds of more things just think about when you do, do work in the front end right you have to think about building and bundling. How do I how do I use Webpack? Do I use Rollup, Partial, blah, blah, blah. Testing, really important. What tools do I use to test my, my, my application? End-to-end -end tools, uh, unit tests, and all that. Code minification, so we don't want to uh, send tons of data to our, to our clients. Uh, we want to keep them small and neat. Uh, then we go into more more other stuff like uh, developer things, code styling, other other tooling like ESLint uh, and all of that. Third-party dependencies, Google Maps. I need to present the map to my user and all of that, right? Look and feel, styling, components, accessibility, communication via APIs. Tons of stuff. Okay. Um, my tip to you is that don't try to solve all of this at once, right? I think you should maintain a uh, focus on, on one thing and do not solve problems that do not exist yet. So it's, no, it's not a bad thing to just start with a static HTML site. You might not need Vue. You might not need Angular or React, right? Start simple and take small steps. Pick one thing and work on that. No more. And this one, the third one, the most important one, I think, is experiment and prototype. Experimenting and prototyping um, is for you, okay? And this is a thing that shouldn't go out in production. And if you are experimenting and prototyping, you need to make sure that your customer or client knows about that, okay? Um, you do it to understand what you're getting yourself into so that you can solve your problem systematically in the future. Last thing about uh, what I want to say about experimenting and prototyping, uh, I've found throughout the years that it's best to time box these things, right? Don't let them, don't get carried away and spend like 40, 50 hours or so on something. Do a small thing, ask for feedback, and continue on working on it, okay? <sighs> okay, a few years ago, I worked uh, on a, in a really big company <coughs> where we talked a lot about frameworks and uh, 
normally as a business you you want to maintain maintain the risks and you want to know what the risks are and so on and so forth um, we had a or tons of applications that used a, a really old uh, framework called knockout anyone heard of that yeah one guy uh, uh, we had uh, tons of angular stuff and all of that and uh, the one thing that they all found out really quickly was that those frameworks did die. So what is what can we do uh, to not be in that position again? Okay, because these things they cost a lot of money to 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 produce. And uh, what is the point of uh, making something that will be obsolete in two years and you have spent tons of money on it? So frameworks they die. Uh, also, in this company, um, in the big change, they wanted to let people be more creative, to to explore new things, not not be stuck in in a box, uh, because they found out that letting people be creative and free in the stuff they do, um, uh, of course, under the business umbrella, uh, uh, leads to to better things better things they build, right? Uh, worldwide business, it's a really big business. Um, location matters. Like, the reason I asked you, uh, do you use React or Vue? If I was in Kalskuna today, everybody would have raised their hands for Vue, <laughs> and no one would have raised their hands for React. Okay? Uh, this is the thing we're not aware of. Uh, uh, so for you to be hearing that Vue is better than React, it is. <laughs> it's probably uh, one of the worst things you can hear. I'm just joking. Um, so this big company, being a multinational company, right? They, you have people that work on different frameworks everywhere. So how do we cater to those people? Okay. Um, also, uh, another thing they found out was that they had built this uh, knockout JS thing, and uh, they used it for everything. They used it for uh, for documentation, for uh, really uh, advanced uh, networking software, and all of that. And uh, documentation was really slow. They didn't need that complexity. So, how what way can we solve? How can we solve this problem for them so that they have faster websites? and uh, that they can get the information that they need. We decided on having a, a um, I don't know if you call it a, a architecture or whatever, but uh, we, s we called it layers of functionality, uh, where we have the first layer, human and interface guidelines. Um, I'd like to show this to you, but I can't because NDAs, uh, but uh, if you go to Apple and search for human interface guidelines, you would see something that we had back then. Uh, so this 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 first layer consists mostly of people working with the user experience and the UIs, and they're really good at their trade. Uh, uh, it was during this time I, I really found like a lot of respect for people that work with UX and UI. Uh, amazing job. So, uh, hands. And uh, do we have anyone from UX UI here? Yeah. <laughs> great so thank you you guys really make uh, the the software look look good and feel great and uh, i want to recognize that okay the second layer was styling and iconography okay like i mentioned before uh we we have these documentation web pages and they they don't need anything more advanced than just a, a style and and some icons right so that's layer two. Layer three, static views. And this is something that you could um, uh, just take from the documentation. Uh, it's a static, a static view is like, a, I'll show an example on it later, but let's say it's a button and it has a definition and that button then uses stuff from layer two and so on and so forth. Okay. Layer four, so we increase in complexity all the time, as long as we go down. There we have components and dynamic views. So components, it could be like a, a select box, for, for instance. 
uh, a dynamic view could be a, a chart or a map or something like that. Okay. Um, and the rest, we leave that to recommendations. So we don't provide them with a the framework. We provide them with a toolkit so that they can use that in their frameworks. Okay. So two recommendations. Um, one of the things we really f that we found was that um, some tooling in the front end space is really obtrusive, right? Uh, and we don't want that. If if you, you work on a, a really large application and uh, you decide that, no, I don't want to use uh, ESLint anymore, then you, I could just remove it and undone. You don't have any great impact on your code. Uh, Cypress and Jest is a must-have, use that. Um, and TypeScript. Uh, TypeScript is a, it's a thing that really, like, it. It's really changed the world for us because we had a ton, tons of uh, uh, Java developers and they really liked TypeScript and uh, they found all sorts of ways to, to share their objects that they had in the back end with us uh, in, 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 the, in the correct form, right? In the correct models. So they really liked TypeScript, helped us. The tools we didn't recommend, however, to, to developers were jQuery, of course, uh, really old uh, framework. Or we have a, we have a jQuery to thank for a lot, but I think its time has passed. Uh, we didn't want developers to use CSS in JS. Um, um, I found throughout the years that there are two camps when it comes to CSS and JS. Um, so. It is exactly what, what it says it is. You use basically define your CSS in JS. And uh, for us, that was a, a weird thing because CSS exists. Why do we need to mix that with JavaScript? No reason, okay? Webpack, uh, also a, a, a bundler. It really like goes deeply into your, into your, your code and the, um, uh, the code base. And it asks a lot of you plugins, and plus no one understands Webpack anyway. So we just said, don't use Webpack. Storybook. Uh, UI and UX people uh, probably use Storybook, and many of you in here probably use Storybook as well. Um, back when I wrote this uh, presentation, uh, Storybook was a thing like Webpack. It really went deeply into your application. You had to define, okay, my application is using Vue, now I have to install tons of plugins, which have to be maintained and all of that. So that's the reason why we didn't recommend that. Uh, but I hear today that Storybook does provide test automation and snapshots of, uh, of your components and the, and the, the code. So uh, I'll take a look at it and get back to you. Next thing, create React app or view CLI and all of those uh, generators. Um, basically, what they do is that they hide tons of complexity in the in the in in, in themselves, right? And we no one knows how that works. So if if it breaks, you're out of luck. Enough talking. Let's show some code. Okay. So, excuse me. Hope everyone can see. So uh, this is what we did. So I'll just show you the layer layer uh, two parts here. So this is the layer two parts, and this is the layer uh, three parts. Okay. So if you were working on a, on a documentation, um, you would probably only use this, nothing else. Okay. So one of the things that we th found to be really important was to rely on standards and uh, not to introduce any funny business just look at standards and thankfully uh, the customer there said uh, you guys you could ignore Internet Explorer 11 and everyone was happy I've never heard so many happy people in the same room to be honest so Chrome Chrome was the thing we should use 
Uh, and what they basically said that throughout the years, they learned that maintaining Internet Explorer uh, 6 back in the days, 7, 8, 9, and all those versions cost tons of money. And uh, they had basically had to do it, but uh, they weren't happy. And uh, a lot of time went into fixing thing th fi things there or features there that uh, provide a little value, they thought. So Chrome it was. Still good on the camera? Um, okay, so let's just walk through it really quickly. So here we have a, a, a UI alert. So we, we, we just basically say that all of our things start with dot .UI, so it's a class, basically. Uh, we have uh, buttons. And then we have some modifiers on those buttons. So a ghost button is a button that doesn't have a background. Uh, and then we have uh, a button that has some, photo, some form of icon. So we try to keep as much as possible inside of the, the styling and the, and the actual structure of the HTML. Okay, And this is what it looks like. Uh, we use our, our own... Uh, <laughs> font library which which then uh, shows the correct icon to the to the end user okay uh, so some of you have probably um, uh, noticed that we have this data type thing here I'll show you an example on later how we use that so um, what we opted to do to be framework agnostic uh, was to actually create all of these uh, components, in this case a uh, UI alert. We created them in pure uh, JavaScript or TypeScript in this case. And uh, that meant that anyone who wanted to create a view version of this was able to do that, or a React version. So all you need is a UI alert, and uh, the, all, of, all of our components um, have this configure, uh, method, and in the configure method, you can uh, give give it some some options. In this case, uh, let's say we have this color prop. You can give it that option. You can give it all sorts of options, like is this a, is a warning thing? Is it danger icons and all of that? Okay. And that component then gets built uh, in in in, in uh, JS or TypeScript, and then you can just use it in in view like this. So what we basically do is we create a new instance of that uh, UI alert. And when this component is mounted, uh, when it's put into the actual DOM, we present it as an alert up in the corner, which says congratulations uh, or something like that. So this is not the entire implementation, but you get the gist of it. Okay. How about testing? Well, UI alert itself has tests. That's a thing that we provide to 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 our end users, which which in this case is is uh, people that work on a framework or something like that. And uh, we assume in this case that UI alert is already tested. But this is the code, or this is the the tests that you had to write in your in your in your framework, right? So what we basically do here is that uh, we have a test here that verifies that uh, a new UI alert is created. We use something called a wrapper builder. I can talk about it more in, in uh, m more later. It's a technical thing and really complex. But basically, what wrapper builder does is that it provides us with a a standard way of creating creating components in in view, right? Uh, if some of you have used the uh, React test utils, you will probably uh, recognize wrapper uh, from from Enzyme. Um, so what we basically say is that now we create this UI alert component, which is a view thing, and we give it some data, which is the alert, the thing that comes from our uh, code, and then we shallow mount it, and then we expect that the alert is presented. One test. Uh, second test is basically that we could we verify that uh, this component, uh, if if a user writes the code like uh, make my alert and make it red, 
we ensure that the, the color is correct on our side. So I think it's a really nice way to uh, keep those two things separate from each other. Okay. Another thing we learned quite early and when it comes to testing is that uh, uh, full disclosure, this is just pseudo code, uh, was that we had uh, customers that really wanted to, uh, so when I say customer, it doesn't mean an end user. It, it could mean a person that works on, on requirements and ensures that requirements are met. Uh, so for us, that was a customer. But we wanted to make sure that we write our tests in a way that they could understand. Okay, So you don't have to be a technical person. Uh, you could read the test and ensure that the requirement is fulfilled. So here's a basic example of, uh, of how we did it a long time ago in the beginning. So what we basically do here is that we have uh, two tests. Uh, one is that just to ensure that there are no items in the basket. And the second test is that if you if you have a, a product and you click on that product and that product gets added to the, the cart, it increases by one. Um, so let's take a look at our, our changed way of doing things. And this is a fixture, basically. That's what we call it. Maybe it's wrong, but that's what we called it. So a fixture is something an uh, 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 end user, a customer for us, would understand. So basically, you have the fi fixture. And in the fixture, you have a met method called add product to basket. You have another method called get basket item count. And probably you'd have one get basket total, which calculates the total price. When they look at what this thing does, they understand it. Okay. And look at the tests. They became so much smaller and easier to read. It has no items in the basket. Take the fixture, you get the basket item count, it's zero. Same thing for, for, the, for the second case there. Uh, add product to basket, get count, one. Awesome. Uh, we found out pretty early that this was a, a great tool for us. Um, um, and we based this on something called use cases uh, internally. And you could use that word externally as well. Uh, so a tip there, if you don't have any use cases, try to think like a user and then write your fixtures in that way. You and your friends and your developer friends will understand that. Oh, my favorite topic. Logic in objects, not in frameworks. <laughs> Hands up, how many of you have heard about this earlier? Great. So this is the number one issue that, uh, uh, that I find everywhere. I am myself responsible for doing that. Um, uh, so I'll, I'm not a perfect, perfect in that sense. Uh, the problem with having logic uh, logic in, in, in the framework or in the views or whatever is that they will spread, and they will spread really fast, the things you, you use. And uh, in a short amount of time, you will find that you probably have 10 different places where you do exactly the same thing. You filter on stuff and whatever, okay? So it's hard to find, and it also increases the complexity when you test test your components, right? So break your shelves. Here comes a really contrived example. Um, here we have a. This is just uh, made up, as I said before. Think of this being in the context of a, of a framework. Okay. So somehow we got the product from the customer. They probably had a select box and they picked a product. And some somehow we we they had a select box and they picked picked a rectangle and they chose like this is supposed to be uh, uh, this room that I'm uh, that, that I'm going to install this uh, carpet in uh, is 10 meters by 10 meters right so all that data we got it and then you go into this um, method inside of the framework 
where you have a total and then you t check if the product shape is a rectangle you check if it's a if it's a circle st a star whatever and you end up having like 10 different cases here just to calculate the total how about just flipping things around a bit okay how about we just say that we have an area and uh, we want to have a which is a, a from a shape so if you have a rectangle you have width times height and then you get the area uh, if you have a circle and so on and so forth and then you can combine all of these uh, later on if you need that so you have you want to have a carpet that is a, is a circle on the one side of the and uh, like uh, square in, in the rest or a rectangle in the rest of the places uh, you could do that later but here we have this re rectangle and uh, in the rectangle we have this width and, uh, and height um, and uh, we create another uh, a class basically this could be a function or whatever and what we just say to it is that here's the price from the product or whatever the price is uh, this you get the shape which is the rectangle and then you'd let it do the work not the framework okay now you can reuse this everywhere in your code bonus testing is made really easy with this as well so there's different schools here some people like to test the entire component test all the inputs see that they get all the results back I'm more leaning towards having this thing be really well tested and I just test the side effect in the component so here we go we get the product uh, the red carpet whatever we get the shape that the user has selected in a selection box so he wants a rectangular the rectangle times 10 times 10 and what the framework does is just uses this thing and it gets back to the price okay um, I'm just I'm not gonna uh, talk about this because Marcus talked about it uh, there he is TDD it's a really great tool and I encourage all of you to at least try it um, uh, I know it has helped me a lot um, and uh, write your tests first and encourage your friends to do the same and keep on doing that and I, I promise you you will get a, a better code base um, for me personally what that has meant is that it has reduced these dumb bugs drastically uh, like small mistakes that I do every day because I'm not perfect I'm a human um, and when we eventually find bugs uh, it's mostly it's not always a bug it's just a requirement thing that we missed okay we didn't fully understand the requirement the program worked as it should but we didn't quite understand the requirement and uh, I remember when I was in in, in, in school I had one uh, an, um, a lecture that told us like okay uh, look at this microphone here uh, how can you show its quality well it's a good microphone it's AKG and I've heard of it. it's probably really good but how do we show quality how we demonstrate quality in software well testing is, is one way of doing that we have a specification, we follow that specification, thereby, I think, it's quality. Okay. Second thing, understand the programming language that you're working in and know its limitations. And this goes for everything you do, basically. Um, when it comes to third-party dependencies, um, what, what a thing I see all the time is like, we just want a map. So the customer says, I want a map and I want to show our, our, our offices on this map. Doesn't mean that you have to import all the other things that this map provider provides for you. You don't have to like provide animations or dragging capabilities and all that. Understand what, what your customer wants and create a wrapper for that and test that wrapper. And later there might come other things that you need to implement but you don't have to do it right now. 
Um, dependencies, um, of course, you need to have a really large test suite and uh, to update your dependency reg dependencies regularly. And uh, yeah, just just do it. Find a day, like a Thursday or a Friday, when you say like, okay, today I will use uh, 15 minutes or 20 minutes just to update dependencies. And you could also do that while waiting for uh, something to build, right? So you maximize your time. Standards. Um, one of the things that uh, enabled us to, like, the one thing I, I really liked about our decision of about just using Chrome was that we could be fully standards compliant. Uh, basically, um, uh, let's let's just take an example. If if we have the uh, Vibrate API for phones or something like that, we could use that, okay? And if that API didn't exist for like a year or two months, but we know it will come, we would just polyfill it, okay? And what happens after some time is that you just remove the polyfill when the feature is widely available in the browser. So the reason we could do that, to take that decision, was that uh, there's a um, committee called TC39 in the JavaScript community, which basically just includes new features into the language in all the browsers. Um, so we trust them, and it, it did pay out well, so we didn't have to come up with our own solutions for that. All right, these are some of the things we did, and I hope you found some inspiration for it um, on working on your own uh, uh, framework or whatever you want to do. Uh, so feel free to leave any questions or comments. I'm happy to take them. Hi, um, this is very refreshing and in inspiring. Um, this is something that I see very often in front end uh, because people normally focus in the framework and not in pattern, design pattern or architecture. So everything is in the component, the logic, all the logic. So you can change uh, to another framework, you can test the logic because it's inside the rendering. So that is a very, very good job. So congratulations. And this invitation also for all, because I think most of the people here is front end, to follow this uh, paradigm um, and this pattern is like create your logic outside your component. You can test it in that way. You are um, not tied to the framework and you can change or not, but you can do it. Um, yeah, very good job. Thank um, you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. I really appreciate that was great. But uh, on the first slide, you show about that not uh, combine uh, CSS uh, with the JavaScript. Yep. So what do you think about this, uh, a styling component? I'm sorry, could you A styling component. Styling a component? Yeah, in, uh, the j in the JavaScript. So it is rejected by you? <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, if exactly. I, if, I, uh, if I understand your question collect correctly, is you want to know how we style the components. No, no, because it's a, it is a React. Uh, so in what, the what do you think about the styling component? Because it's basically CSS in GS. In GS, we are doing the styling component, and we are not creating any CSS, and we are doing uh, everything. It's a uh, styling in the GS. So, do you think that is um, not a good uh, combination, or what do you think? <laughs> oh, uh, I don't have uh, much knowledge about that, but uh, uh, I'll just say this, I don't have the knowledge about that. Uh, as I said, I'm not a React developer, but it sounds to me that like that adds uh, complexity. And um, uh, I don't really know what it looks like, so if you could show me later, I'd be interested in uh, seeing it. Uh, and uh, maybe we could have a talk about that later. Yeah. It's, it's a 
Oh, basically, okay. Yeah. Yeah. For, yeah. Um, as I said, uh, in my world, that wouldn't work. Uh, <laughs> basically. I want to try to make a general case for CSS in JS. <laughs> Please don't. <laughs> so very succinctly, if you have regular CSS, and I would argue that most of you who do don't, you are using some kind of preprocessor, which adds complexity. But for the sake of argument, let's say you're using regular CSS. In that model, you write selectors and then styles that apply to those selectors. And if, you, if your selectors are only ever classes, then that's quite easy to work with. And if you look at specific component in your library, whether it's React or Vue or whatever, yep. you can find out, like you see that, okay, this component has these classes, and then you can search for those classes, and then you can find what styles are being applied to those components. Correct. But if you're not using just classes in your selectors, maybe you have selectors that apply to all Li elements that are descendants of elements with this class and so on, then you are unable to look at a component and immediately figure out what styles are being applied to these components. You have no way of knowing that. But if you're using a CSS in JS solution, you can look at a component and immediately see what styles are being applied to this component. In regular CSS, you have the selectors. That's like a drunk with a machine gun shooting into the dark. It might hit what you're looking for. It might hit some innocent bystanders. You have no clue. But in my safe CSS in JS world, I look at my component and I'm in complete control of what styles are being applied to this component. Yeah. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> Let's not start any wars. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, can I just respond to that real quickly? Um, uh, it was a, it was a de decision we took basically, and uh, um, to make it easier to find stuff. Actually, um, when we did this initially, uh, CSS and JS didn't exist. Th that was a thing um, that we uh, we talked about when it came out later, and it wasn't a fit for us. Um, and also, I just think it adds complexity. It's, I think C CSS and JS adds complexity. Basically, that's that's what I think. Uh, and the, I do hear you. I hear your argument, uh, uh, and I'm not shooting it down. Uh, just two different views. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah thanks for the for the presentation. Um, um, I was wondering, um, uh, given um, uh, from what I understood, um, some of the the Ideals um, uh, guiding the decision making was around like being standards compliant, having things that are sort of evergreen, where like as the situation changes, um, uh, you can continue reusing them. Um, so given that, um, I'm kind of curious um, uh, uh, why you would go with um, something like Vue instead of something that's actually standard, like a web component or lit elements, um, uh, if, if that is your yeah perspective. Uh, really good question, actually. Um, the thing is that um, in my sphere, uh, at this time, I, I wasn't involved in the Vue or React or the web component stuff at all. But our idea was that if we make this uh, um, JavaScript based without any framework interference, then people that consume our, our APIs, which this is, uh, they could do that on their own. So uh, they could probably use web components in the future. There's, that's nothing that stops them from, from using that. But they could still use our, uh, you know, JavaScript components, and I don't know. I might be lying. I don't know if web c components was available at that time. I really don't. Uh, 
So you got me there. Great question. Thank you. I'm sorry? What time was it? Um, 16, 17, 18 and a half. Thank you.